got about five minutes before the program starts if you'd like to grab a drink and find your seats. I may need the drum roll. It's going to be last call here in a few minutes, so please find your seats. Welcome everybody. This is the 12th annual Steffi Address and I'm just so thrilled to see everyone here tonight. My name is Liz Fowler and I serve as the Executive Director for the Cleveland Zoological Society. Really a hearty welcome from the bottom of my heart. I'm just really thrilled to see everyone here. Billy Steffi asked me to say a few words tonight because she's not able to be with us tonight. She believes in the zoo and she believes in the work that we do together. She believes in her grandchildren. Abby and Sydney and Dawson, who I think are the great pride and joy of her life, and one of them wants to be a zoo vet. And we are just so grateful to the Steffi family for selecting Cleveland Metro Park Zoo as their zoo, their family zoo. It's really a wonderful tradition here. Billy sent me a text yesterday, and I think for those of you who know her well, uh, her text speaks volumes. She wrote to me, I'm thinking of all of you, and know you will knock it out of the park, as you always do. So that was a wonderful lift to, to receive yesterday. I wanted to pause for a minute and ask each of you to raise your glass as a toast to Billy Steffi, who can't be here tonight, but I think she's here in spirit. So you're here for Billy Steffi. And I wanted to now introduce Chris Kuhar as the Executive Director of Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Chris is a wonderful leader with great vision and team building skills. And you're gonna see something that we've never done here before this evening, which is have kind of a talk show format. So I'm really excited to ask Chris Kuhar to come up to the podium. And one last thought I have is that I think Billy is very proud of the work that this zoo is able to do with her support and encouragement. And I think she'd be proud of every one of you for coming tonight. And with all of that together, I'm gonna to ask Chris to come up here and start knocking it out of the park. Chris? So can you all hear me? Okay, good, that actually works. That's step one. Um, so welcome to the 12th annual David Steffi Lecture in Veterinary Medicine. So if you've been here in the past, you know that while it's the lecture in Veterinary Medicine, we kind of are liberal with the term veterinary medicine in, in terms of what we talk about here, because we, we sort of talk about the whole gamut of animal health and welfare, but, um, and we've also sort of made some changes from the original format where it was the kind of standard lecture, where there's a scientist up here, and they're, you're talking about slides, and there's lots of graphs, and uh, maybe there's a picture of an animal, um, but for the most part, it's, it was a science-based lecture. Um, Dr. Kristen Lucas, who's in the back there, uh, and I, we, we sat on a panel not too long ago with the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums and focusing on a book that was published called Don't Be Such a Scientist, um, where the whole idea was scientists, the way scientists talk to other scientists about science doesn't translate to the rest of the world, um, which is part of the reason why science doesn't get incorporated nearly as often as it should into policy decisions and, and just general decision making. So, a few years ago, we tried to change that a little bit. We tried to change the format up a little bit, make it a little bit informal. And based on the fabu fabulous crowd tonight, I think it's, it may be working. Because I think more and more people are sort of getting interested in what we have to say. 
mostly because of how we say it. So this year we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to sort of be, I told someone I was going to try and shoot for somewhere between Jimmy Fallon and Merv Griffin. Um, <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to try and um, bring up our vets here because it's been a little while since we were actually really talked veterinary medicine. So um, we actually have three clinical veterinarians on staff here. Um, and I wanted to introduce them to all of you tonight and get, get a little opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about them. So I'll, I'll start with um, our, our chief veterinarian and actually the, the David Stiffy chair in, in zoological medicine. We, I, I counted, we have five DVMs on staff. We have four PhDs. We're going to be hiring two more PhDs within the next few months. And we've got three PhD candidates, but there's only one doc. So with that, Dr. Albert Lewandowski. So if I doze off, it's because Rachel made the chairs way too comfy. So hopefully it's nothing. So I guess when you're first, you get to be called Doc, right? I, so. I, I think it was. Uh, it was originally to distinguish me from Alan Saronin because everybody called him Al. My first name is Albert. And in order not to confuse us, everybody just said Doc. And it's kind of stuck ever since. So talk a little bit about your career. You've been here now since 1989. As veterinarian, I've been here since 1989. But uh, most people don't realize that I actually started here uh, in 1969. Uh, I was 16 years old. And uh, I was working as a page in the main library downtown. And, and although I, I love being in, in with the, uh, all the books and stuff, I really wanted to be outside. And the statute of limitations is, is probably well past. I used to be one of those kids who snuck in the fence at night into the zoo and wreaked havoc. And I thought, what a great place to work. You're outside. There's all these cool animals. I think I'd like to do that. So I came down and applied for a job here. I'm 16 years old, my senior year of high school. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sitting out at the ticket barrel taking tickets and renting baby strollers. And uh, this elderly gentleman in a three-piece suit pulls up. And uh, he walks right past the ticket booth. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, i got to stop this guy. He's coming into the zoo. He doesn't have a ticket. <laughs> and, <clears throat> So I said, uh, good morning. He says, good morning. And I said, well, you really need to have a ticket to get into the zoo. And he gets this really funny look on his face, and then he breaks into a smile. And I said, well, if you talk to the lady in the booth back there, she'll be able to set you up. So uh, he wanders back. And uh, the next thing you know, the lady comes flying out of the booth. I just stopped Dr. Goss, who was the director, from coming into his own zoo. <laughs> And, and Jane Vajda is busy, is busy berating me for, for stopping the director. And he walks up, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And he says, son, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. <laughs> so that was, my, that was my beginnings here. So I, I worked here from uh, 1969 through 1977. And then uh, in 1978, I graduated from Ohio State's Veterinary College and went into small animal practice in Parma on Pearl Road. And after about two years of that, um, n nothing to disparage uh, people who, who like working on domestic pets, it wasn't really for me. And uh, that following year, I took a residency at the Philadelphia Zoo and the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And uh, for the outrageous salary of $12,000 a year, uh, I got to work all day at the zoo and half the night at the university. Uh, it was probably two of the most interesting years of my life. Um, veterinary medicine was, was just coming of age in zoos. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the veterinarian that I mentored under, uh, she was incredibly good uh, uh, academic. She wasn't really good in the clinics. And so she would uh, she'd discuss the case with me and turn me loose. So for two years, I had run of the Philadelphia Zoo and did pretty much whatever I wanted to. Um, after that, I moved to, uh, to the Detroit Zoological Barks. 
and uh, I spent six years there. And then the opportunity came up to come back to Cleveland. And so in 1989, uh, I took over from uh, uh, Dr. Went and Dr. Lech, and I became the first full-time veterinarian here. So that's kind of how I ended up here. Uh, I'm glad to be home. So this has been home for 27 years. A lot has changed, not just at the zoo, but in veterinary medicine in 27 years. True. Talk a little bit about that. We did a lot more hands-on type things when I started. Um, we only had a very small handful of anesthetic agents that were, that were uh, worth anything in zoo animals. We had, uh, we had ketamine, which had been around for a while. Um, we had xylazine, which was a brand new drug. Uh, we had a torphine, which is one of these ultra potent uh, narcotics. And uh, we had brutothane. You, know, you get a great big guy to jump on it and you work on it while it's flailing. <laughs> and uh, that, was this, that was pretty much the sum total of the anesthetics that we had at that time. And uh, you got really good at, at uh, doing things very quickly. Um, and you had, to, you had to be very careful about the cases that you chose to anesthetize because it was a very dangerous uh, proposition. And I think one of the best things that's, that's happened over the years is they've developed many, many very good anesthetic agents that we can use today. Uh, we've done a lot of surgeries over the past 20 years with these new anesthetic agents and it's become uh, very safe. I mean, we still have to be careful with what we do, um, but it's, there's not this tremendous hesitation um, that uh, I don't want to go in and anesthetize it because the anesthesia is worse than the, than the, uh, than the problem that they have. And so I think these, the development of these uh, anesthetic agents has been, uh, has been good. Um, another thing that we, we've shifted the emphasis on is um, the uh, enrichment and the habitats that these animals go into. Um, everybody deplores the, uh, the, the tile bathroom uh, uh, primate cages that we used to use. And you have to look at these things in their, in, in their context. Um, when, uh, when those cages were built, uh, we didn't have good uh, uh, anthelmintics and, and good uh, anti-parasite drugs. And so in order to keep the animals from reinfecting themselves, you had to put them into an environment where you could clean it. So therefore, the bathroom tile uh, cages were very important at that time, and keeping things scrupulously clean were very important. And I think now we've been able to move away from that and uh, uh, give the animals a little bit more of an enriching uh, environment uh, to live in. So I think that's a, I think that's a, a really big change in what we do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add another one because it's a personal story that you probably don't remember. So I started at the zoo as an intern in 1995 and you were gracious enough to let me dig into some of the animal records as I was working on what became my master's project and I was working on Joffrey's Tamarins. And back in the day, we, the, the animal data collection consisted of like essentially like little note cards that were written on and stuck in a file folder. I'm looking for Tad, I know Tad remembers these. Um, and one of the animals that I found in going through my records was noted as being the father of five animals and the mother of nine animals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when I came to you and said, Doc, I don't understand uh, why this animal's both dad and mom to a bunch of animals, your, your response was, just like it just was. <laughs> Because that was in the, that was probably, those animals were probably in the early 80s when record keeping was actually just starting. In well, we, we, we used to keep all the animal records on uh, these little blue index cards. And, and if you go to the old registrars, the old record keepers and all the zoos, they all kept them on blue index cards. I don't know why, but if you, if you mentioned, you know, the blue, blue cards, they knew exactly what you were talking about. Um, in their defense, when you're looking at a lot of these exotics, telling whether it's a boy or a girl can be really challenging. And so when we mark the sex of an animal, you mark it in pencil. 
Well, and there weren't the there weren't the data checks that you have in the in the spreadsheets and the databases that we work with today. But. Yeah, we've we've gotten very good at identifying the animals. Uh, one of the very first things that I did when I got when I got here was uh, I went through the entire animal collection and tattooed an identifying number on every single uh, major animal in the collection, uh, including a, a uh, the male chimpanzee. And next to his number, I put a little heart. I don't know if they ever found that. Um, but now we've got some, some really interesting technology. We've got these uh, transponders. You use them in your dogs and cats now. And uh, a lot of the animals, we just slip those transponders and it's really nice because you wave a wand over them and you've got a 10-digit code that tells you exactly who that animal was. And I can remember we had three polar bears in the collection. And uh, the keepers all swore that they could tell them apart and the curator swore that you know, he knew which animal was which. And uh, so they would point an animal out to me, we'd knock it down, and it wasn't, the, it wasn't the male, it was a female, and it wasn't the female that they said it was, it was the other one, because I had tattooed the inside of the lip and you could read, and they couldn't tell who any of these animals were. So by putting tags in their ears and these transponders in, we can finally get some identification on these things that's a little more reliable. So the field has changed, but but I know you've spent a lot of time, I mean, you did it with me, spent a lot of time training the next generation. You've, you've spent a lot of, how many, how many vets or vet techs do you think have gone through the doors of the zoo as a training ground over the years? We've got a, a collaborative program with uh, Cuyahoga Community College and we, uh, we have 20 students rotate through here <laughs> every year and then two get to spend uh, eight weeks with us in the springtime. So multiply that times 27. Um, <clears throat> we probably have three or four uh, veterinary students rotate with us uh, every, every year. Uh, not to mention the ones who just kind of uh, drift in and drift out because they happen to be in the neighborhood and, and they stop by. Um, and I've also had uh, a very good associate uh, who's now the chief veterinarian at the Dallas Zoo, Dr. Bonner. Uh, he, he came to me and he was still green behind the, the ears and uh, uh, he turned out to be a, a, a really excellent veterinarian. So he's, he's down in Texas now. And I have two new people, so. So you, you mentioned Dr. Bonner, Dr. Bonner left and we had to replace Dr. Bonner. We replaced Dr. Bonner. Um, we, di we did a uh, fairly extensive search and you're looking for two things when you're, when you're trying to find an associate. You're looking for somebody who has good skills in veterinary medicine, uh, but you're also looking for somebody who has a personality that meshes with the entire organization. And after, uh, after interviewing people from all over the country, uh, we finally found somebody who was working down in Akron, and that turned out to be Dr. Uh, Mike Selig. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Selig. Thank you. I get to move up a chair. Yes, so. Welcome. Thank you. It's so yeah, weird, a tough right? act to follow. Yeah. So, so you've been here how long now? Uh, it'll be six years this November. So, talk, so talk a little bit about your background. So I kind of took a little bit of a non-traditional way of, of getting here. I, um, you know, was one of those kids that um, you know, was always going out and, and catching animals and bringing them home. And fortunately, I had really understanding parents and uh, you know, let me have you know, a small zoo at home, it seemed. Um, but it wasn't until I, I you know, got to high school and started working for the local vet clinic that uh, I really you know, found veterinary medicine as something that you know, really interested me. Um, from there, I you know, went to Ohio State and you know, quickly you know, realized that becoming a zoo vet, it's really hard. Like, there, there's just not many jobs available. And um, you know, I, I kind of decided that you know, small animal medicine was going to be you know, where I was going to practice, you know, get to see some exotics as well. Um, so when I graduated, that's what I did. Um, after about a year, I you know, was fortunate enough to be able to move to a different practice that actually did about 50% exotics um, down in Barberton. They did a lot of uh, wildlife rehab, 
Uh, but the really cool part was they did uh, all the animals for the Akron Zoo as well. So I got my, my foot in the door there, um, such that you know after six years of working there, this position became available, and you know I applied and was really fortunate enough to you know to get the, the job, and you know it's, it's just been an amazing you know ride so far. So why zoos? Why zoos as as the place to practice veterinary medicine? Well. You know, I think, you know, working in small animals was wonderful. You know, I think, you know, the, the thing that I, you know, miss the most there is, is probably the, the people. Um, but, you know, the animals in zoos is, is really what, you know, draws me to, you know, working in this field. You know, to be able to work on so many different species, um, different problems, you know, each day is going to be, you know, different. Um, that's really why I, you know, enjoy working here. So, once upon a time, the vet was the only person in the zoo that really had science training, right? I mean, most of the animal keeper staff were laborers or, or, or farm laborers. There, there were very few people, probably when you started, that had a bachelor's degree in science, let alone a DVM, right? Now, I, the science is much more common. Can you guys talk a little bit about how you integrate science in what you do, how you, how you get information you know, you did a lot of experimenting, learning on the run, but now there's a lot of information out there. How do, you, how do you access that science? How do you use that science? Sure, I mean, we definitely do science as, you know, people think of, you know, science as being research and, you know, whenever there are projects that require involvement, we try and participate as much as we can. Um, but you're right, I mean, science now happens on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, just looking up the drug dosage for a species you haven't worked on, you know, looking at a formulary and trying to, you know, extrapolate from one species to another. Um, it can, you know, it can work with anatomy. So if, if there's differences in anatomy, you're, you're looking that up um, and trying to, you know, figure out how you're going to do things. Um, some things as simple as, you know, you know, where do you draw blood in the species to, you know, more complicated things like, you know, how do we do, you know, surgery on a particular animal species. Um, it, it, it definitely varies. So I know Doc's told me in the past that he deserves the pay of multiple uh, uh, MDs because he does everything an MD does, but he does it on lots of different <laughs> species, right? So, Doc, talk about uh, an interesting case, something that's unusual that when you, when you work in the world of zoo veterinary medicine, stuff happens on a daily basis where it, didn't, it wasn't in your planner when the day started. Can you talk a little bit about something like that? Probably the, uh, the best case we've had recently was uh, we had an ostrich that we got as a chick and uh, as she matured uh, she became egg, egg bound and uh, brought her into the hospital and we realized that she had a collapsed pelvis. So we had the option of uh, either spaying her or trying to correct the, 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 the abnormality in the pelvis and uh, we, we were able to get the eggs out and uh, we're trying to figure out, well, what do, we, what do we do with this? So we ended up running her through the CT scanner, and uh, Dr. Selig was able to take the, the images that we had and able to do three-dimensional modeling of the, uh, of the pelvis of this animal. And we actually sat there and measured how big an ostrich egg is, and then we compared that to the drawings that we had on the CT scanner uh, images, and we figured out that we not only had to shave part of the pelvis off, but we had to split the pelvis in two other areas and reverse that, that piece of bone, put it in backwards, and uh, expand it to the point where uh, she'd be able to lay another egg, and then we pinned and screwed that. And uh, um, I, I, an orthopedic surgeon asked, you know, how did we come up with this? And it's one of those Um, I, 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 I'm very thankful that when physicians do things, they do the same thing over and over and over again, um, because I, 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 I feel better going into, into a hospital knowing that they've done this before. Um, our patients don't really complain. The ostrich uh, didn't know we had <laughs> done this before. So. And as it turned out, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful piece of surgery. Uh, the animal has laid eggs since that time, and uh, we're in the process of trying to write that thing up because it's never been done before and it hasn't been done since. So, That's I mean, those, those are the kinds of things that, uh, that uh, make this worthwhile.
That's hard to top, right? He took, he took a good story, but the same question to you. Talk about something that you're particularly proud of, something really interesting that we've done here. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The, the ostrich is hard to top. That's definitely one of the, you know, that's, 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 that's about as high as you can get. Um, but for me, if I had to pick a second, um, probably be back our gorilla uh, would be number two. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, you know we, we are actively monitoring our gorillas for, for ongoing heart disease. Um, and in the past, um, as recently as a few years ago, you know, if one of them was sick, really the only way that we could evaluate them was to anesthetize them and you know, try and figure out what was going on. Um, you know, the idea of anesthetizing an animal with heart disease really doesn't you know, sit well with me. Um, however, you know, through you know, the hard work of you know, our keepers, our technicians, and I don't know where Joan is, but um, you know, Joan Kramer, one of our um, zoo volunteers. Is Joan out there? Where's uh, Joan? Where's Joan? Stand up, Joan. Stand up, Joan. So they, they've all been able to, you know, really work with the gorillas and develop some, you know, non-invasive diagnostics. You know, we're able to now routinely get um, heart rates on a daily basis. Whenever we want to, we can go up there and do voluntary uh, cardiac ultrasounds. Uh, and, and more recently, we've been able to get um, voluntary blood samples. We've been working on ECGs, hopefully blood pressures in the future. So it really allows us to, you know, manage those cases. And, and in relation to BBAC, you know, there have been a couple times where you know, he's been sick and we've been able to go up there and by looking at these you know, diagnostics, you know, we've been able to determine in, in one case that you know, he had developed an arrhythmia. Um, so we were able to talk with his cardiologist. Yes, he has a cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, look at his drugs, make some adjustments, and you know, avoid an unnecessary anesthesia. You know, that was one episode. You know, the other was you know, just this past December, you know, he was having a very similar episode where he was lethargic, not, not wanting to eat as much. And um, you know, I'll, I'll admit, I kind of had my, my blinders on where, oh, it's a gorilla with heart disease, like he, he must be having a problem. And um, you know, we, we did those diagnostics and you know, they weren't the same as before. You know, they were indicative of him having you know, a good a heart, a heart that looked healthy. Um, we still tried adjusting his meds just to see if that was the problem, but it, it really didn't you know, fix the issue. So, you know, these diagnostics that we'd put in place to, you know, basically get us off the hook of having to do these exams were pointing us in the direction of needing to do an exam. And we, after some, you know, soul searching, we, we did that and ended up finding that he had a, a small abscess within his spermatic cord on the left side of his, or just above his left testicle. Uh, we were able to do a hemicastration and it completely resolved his, his problem. And, you know, he's had a, a great outcome from that. So it was really rewarding to, you know, see all that work put in by, by everyone and to you know, be able to manage these guys so much more effectively and, and with confidence. So cardiac ultrasound was on the work plan in Philadelphia in 1982, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, 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 I, when I first started in veterinary medicine, car, uh, ultrasound machines were the size of a refrigerator and now they're the size of a laptop and you could barely image a horse's heart. That's how big they were and how primitive they were. And now it's a little laptop. So along that time, there's a, there's a whole generation of vet students now that are being trained with this kind of equipment. It's what they learn in vet school. And we were lucky enough to add a third veterinarian this year. So with that, I'd like to introduce our third veterinarian, Dr. Deborah Barberitz. Your homegrown talent. Let's let's talk a little bit about your story. Sure. Um, so, like Dr. Lewandowski and Dr. Selig, I am also from Northeast Ohio, um, from Broadview Heights, and um, I I like to say that I'm a product of the Free Mondays here at the zoo. I grew up here. <laughs> um, my dad used to take me pretty much every Monday um, before I went to kindergarten. So, um, from a very young age, I was into everything I could possibly do here at the zoo. Um, I, you know, was in zoo crew with the education department for three years. I put on puppet shows and painted faces, and I was terrible at it, but um, <laughs> it got me here, so I was thrilled. Um, and then after, um, after my zoo crew, so up in my senior year of, of high school, um, the Sarah Allison Steffi Center for Zoo Medicine opened, 
and I was one of the first people um, you know, there one of the first days, and I remember watching Dr. Lewandowski work on a flamingo. Um, and I used to follow them from room to room, and Doc jokes now that I was his stalker and he didn't know it, <laughs> but um, I did kind of follow him around the zoo. Um, but yeah, the, the Steffi Center opened there and it just opened my eyes to, to zoo medicine. Um, and I stayed in Cleveland for my undergraduate degree. I went to Case Western and Reserve University. And, with, and during that time, I got involved with the conservation and science department here at the zoo um, as an intern and then left for veterinary school at The Ohio State University and focused on zoo and wildlife medicine there. So in my second year, I came back again um, to the zoo, again with the conservation and science department to um, do turtle research in the Ohio Erie Canal. So I was out in waders looking for turtles, um, anything I could to, to be around animals in the zoo. Um, oh, can you hear me? Nope. No, and we're back. <laughs> that, that's a little better. Um, so um, after I went um, to vet school, um, after I graduated, I actually um, worked in small animal medicine, mostly, um, in Columbus, Ohio, as an emergency overnight veterinarian. And I truly did love and still love emergency medicine. It's one of my passions and pets. Um, but zoo medicine has always been my true focus. So after um, some time in private practice, I came and was offered a 15-month internship here at the zoo with this department. And I guess that's when it truly solidified that I wanted to work here as a veterinarian in this department. Um, didn't know how long that would take. So after, after that, I went on to work in zoo and wildlife medicine at Cornell University. So um, I worked on exotic pets and uh, ran a wildlife center and was a contract veterinarian for the Syracuse Zoo, the Rosamond Gifford Zoo in Syracuse, New York. And while I was there, um, they opened a new vet position and I applied. And honestly, um, never would have thought that this, you know, I could have achieved this dream um, so early in my career. So I'm truly honored and, and blessed to be a part of Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and to be part of this veterinary team. So I look forward to what we do. So, so you need to be aware of some controversy here, because while, while the, the real credit for you being here probably belongs to your dad and bringing you here on three Mondays, I will tell you that the Conservation Education Department takes credit for you being here because of your zoo crew days, the Conservation and Science Department takes credit for your intern days, and I personally credit Billy Steffi and the, Steffi, the Sarah Allison Steff, Steffi Center for Zoological Medicine and what we've been able to do with the zoo program. So unfortunately, Billy wasn't here today, but I'm looking for the camera. A lot of places talk about being training grounds for the future talent and, and the future of an industry. You're looking at the, the future of an industry that got trained because of the commitment that, that Billy had to this organization and the commitment that our veterinarian staff have had to training students, not just you, but a number of students that have come through the doors over the years. So I, I, want, I want to say thanks to Billy first and foremost for being able to provide that opportunity. Yes. And thanks to your dad. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Billy. <laughs> so, so obviously your vet school ex experience at Ohio State was certainly different than Doc's vet school experience. Um, I'm guessing that there is a, a different approach to animal welfare and an emphasis on the, the holistic health of an animal, not just treating an illness. Can you talk a little bit about sure. what welfare looks like in, in zoo medicine today? Sure, so um, animal welfare is basically kind of the combination of an animal's physical health, um, mental health, and um, emotional health. So it's kind of this interplay of these things all the time. Um, and you know, as, as veterinarians, as zoo veterinarians, we define you know, good welfare when an animal is, is healthy. Um, when they're well taken care of, well nourished, when they're free to express you know, their natural behaviors um, and free from pain and fear. Um, so veterinary medicine is essential to you know, providing good animal welfare. We're out on a daily basis providing preventative care, meaning um, whether it's just a um, routine exam, you know, vac vaccinations, um, dental care, and then on the other aspect, you know, we're taking care of an aging population of animals, and we provide those animals geriatric care. Um, and the focus there is more on, um, you know, quality of life versus quantity. 
So, um, in every decision we make in medicine, we have to look at this animal's welfare. Um, so that we are ensuring, you know, not only that they're physically healthy in this state that they're in now, but that what we do for them is good for their overall being. So, Dr. Seelig, when you, when you go through your day, there's not a tremendous amount of time to do research and answer. You probably have more questions in going through a day than you have answers, right? Sure. Um, so today, in a, in, in a modern zoo, in our zoo in particular, we have a science team. Can you talk a little bit about how vets interact with the science team, how vets can use science moving forward as opposed to being the only science trained individual in an organization, which is where we came from once upon a time? Sure, we're, we're lucky in that um, you know, we've got a you know, conservation and science department um, that you know, we're able to work with. Um, you know, a really good example is you know, that anteater video that you're seeing up there. You know, we were able to really you know, identify when that animal was gonna give birth within a matter of just a few days. You know, us ultrasounding, it was just to confirm what they, they kind of already knew by hormone monitoring. Um, there's a lot of examples in the park where we're you know, doing hormone monitoring to uh, you know, really help facilitate decision-making processes. Um, and it, it you know, definitely makes our job a lot, a lot easier um, you know, working with that department. So it's a different zoo today, Doc, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you've, you, you've seen a lot of changes over the years. Talk about your favorite part about being a zoo veterinarian. <laughs> Working with the animals has always been a, a big part of, of being a zoo veterinarian. But I really think that um, the thing that, that holds you to this place is the people that you work with. Uh, it's, it's their passion, uh, it's a shared passion. And you come into work every day and you have people that are enthused about being here, who want to be here who want to do a good job. Um, I've worked in plenty of places where you, know, you had to, you had to uh, take a club to get your employees to get, get stuff done. It's not like that here. The people who work here for the most part want to be here, they want to do a good job, and, and they're devoted to the animal collection here. And I think that's the thing that, that really holds uh, most of us to this institution is this, this common shared love for what we're doing. Dr. Barber, same question for you. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to agree with Doc. Um, I guess it's the people, you know, I think that sounds strange to a lot of people because a lot of people assume that we come, become veterinarians because we love animals and we don't wanna work with people. Um. <laughs> there is some truth to that. <laughs> I mean, I can say that yes, we, we love the animals. Um, we wouldn't be here if we didn't. I mean, it's the coolest part of our job is to be a zoo vet. Um, but it's, it is truly the people. You know, behind every animal, there's a person, whether it's, you know, at home with your pets or, um, you know, livestock and farmers. But for us here at the zoo, um, behind all of our animals are, you know, curators and keepers, um, education staff, and, conservation staff, there's volunteers and docents and zoo guests and everyone is so f interested and supportive of um, the animals and that we care for. So um, it's really exciting to be a part of a team where everyone cares for all of the animals regardless of their size or taxon or whether or not they're globally important, just the individual animal themselves. So um, yeah, I, I would have to say the people that I get to interact with and um, the ones that, that get behind you and want you to succeed. So I think, yeah. Dr. Selig, I don't know how you follow that answer. So um, <laughs> about I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you a different question, and I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what the hardest part of your job, not your least favorite, but what's the hardest part of your job? Uh, um, compared to you know private practice, the amount of paperwork that's involved is probably <laughs> uh, <laughs> just Just it's just uh, exponentially more. Uh, so that's probably the most challenging thing is just trying to keep up with the, uh, the detail that's required so that you know, we can have accurate records that we can go back to and, and learn from. Um, you know, we just you know, don't have to, not that we don't keep records in private practice, but the, the amount of detail isn't there compared to, to what we have to do here. Um, it's just daunting at times. So as is, I don't know if anyone looked at my office, but there's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> yeah, there is. 
Thank you for not saying people. Uh, <laughs> Doc, hardest part, hardest part of the job. I'd have to agree with him. The paperwork is, is, enough, to, is enough to kill you. Um, and it's not even so much the medical records, but it's all the bureaucracy that goes with it. Uh, the, the medical records are important because uh, it's not just for our, our uh, reference, but these records will exist for hundreds of years. Uh, the Philadelphia Zoo has started, uh, started their record keeping system around the, uh, uh, around the time of the Civil War. And uh, when I did my residency there, I was able to look back at records that had been handled by people 100 years before I came along. And I think uh, uh, maintaining those records is important, but there's so many other paper things that need to be filled out that <laughs> it just, it becomes overwhelming. Just make up stuff on the blue cards, that's what they do in a while. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so um, Dr. Selig, I, uh, you get to have an interaction with animals um, in a way that most folks don't. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with our gorillas and, <laughs> and, and what that looks like for those of us who have been able to Perfectly. see it and those who haven't. So um, to sum it up, our gorillas kind of have my number. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, there have been multiple occasions where, you know, pro probably the, the best one, I guess, would be, you know, we were going to, you know, look at another animal that was kind of on the way um, past the gorillas. And um, there's a keeper in front of me and a vet student behind me. And um, <laughs> we, we took the turn the corner. And um, I can't believe I'm telling you this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the gorillas uh, was, was there waiting for me and let out this, this you know, sharp you know, scream. And myself, fearing for my life, dropped to the ground in the fetal position. <laughs> and um, I looked up because I, I was not attacked by a gorilla. And both the keeper and vet student were looking down at me, wondering <laughs> what their leader was doing. So yeah, they, they definitely have my number. I mean, even just you know, passing by the, the cage, you know, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go by and I, I think I'm getting a pass and you know, no, I have to go back and I'll let my guard down and you know, they'll do something as you know, minor, it's just a little flinch and I'll just jump out of my skin. So you know, they definitely get a rise out of you know, seeing my reaction. Once they get you to react the first time. Yeah, no, they, they, they know me. <laughs> so, so Doc, I, I, I asked your wife Karen to give me a story or two, but most of them I couldn't actually say up here on the podium. <laughs> um, but um, one thing she did mention, and I think she had that um, ground truth with uh, your colleagues up here, is that you have a sort of gruff exterior, right? Me? I think, yeah. <laughs> me. But um, so I'll, I'll ask, maybe I'll ask Dr. Seeley and Dr. Barber, who's the, who's the first one to coo over a baby animal and, and break out the camera? Uh, on the vet team. <laughs> I, I, I would definitely point to Doc. I mean, when, when uh, we did the neonate exam on, on our baby orangutan, you know, I was the one in there with the mother doing the CT, and he was the one that you know, volunteered to hold the neonate and, <laughs> and do the exam. And if I remember correctly, when we had the first baby anteater yeah. here, he was you know, adamant that he was going to do the neonate exam on that one. So uh, as, as gruff as he may seem, he's definitely a big softie at heart. <laughs> Seniority has its privileges. Right? Yeah, that's true. So. All right, so we've talked about the past. I want to spend a couple minutes here and talk about the future. So I'll start with you, Deb. What, what do you see the future of zoo medicine looking like? What do you see this zoo's role looking like in, in veterinary medicine moving forward? Um, so I think, uh, you know, veterinary medicine in, in general is kind of taking a, a much more collaborative approach. Um, the One Health um, concept is kind of something that comes to mind um, for something that we strive for in the future as zoo veterinarians. Um, it's kind of the idea that human health and animal health and ecosystem health are all kind of connected. And, and you know, being veterinarians in a zoo, there's no way for us to know everything about every animal that's going to come along our way. So we're relying now on 
um, you know, human health entities and researchers and conservationists out in the field to, to find out more about the animals that we care for and how we can use that information in, in our own zoos. Um, so I definitely think, um, you know, just broadening our horizons and, and using resources that we wouldn't necessarily have thought of in the first place. Um, and I guess where I, I see Cleveland Metro Parks, you know, how we fit into this and where we will be um, leaders, uh, I'm sure all of you have, have gone down and seen the Steffi Center. We're one of the only zoos in the country with a CT. That's huge. Um, you know, it's someone that has worked at universities. Most of the places that have CTs are universities. To have one in a zoo is, is an enormous privilege. Um, and I, I see us moving forward, hopefully, you know, using that resource a lot more effectively and being the one, um, the zoo that people come to, not only to use our equipment, but to um, to be the ones that answer the questions on what do you do with this and how do we treat it and where should we go from here. And I think we're, we're working towards that. Um, but one part, you know, of our, our one aspect of, of veterinary medicine that I do think we really set industry standards in um, is our cooperative training. Um, our, our keepers and our technicians and ourselves, um, you know, I know my colleagues have talked a little bit about it, but they're out there constantly, you know, training giraffe and elephant, um, lions, gorillas, orangs, you know, you name it, um, to do anything from participating in their own diagnostic exams to treatments. So like the echoes we talked about, um, blood draws, we've talked about um, nebulization therapies, other things. So, you know, anesthesia isn't the only way anymore. And our, I think other institutions are recognizing what a resource we have in our staff um, and their ability to get these trainings done. Um, so, you know, other institutions are starting to ask us, you know, can, can we show you how to do that? Um, and I think, you know, we're going to improve more and more, but I do think that we are on the cutting edge of, of what's out there in the zoos already. Okay. Dr. Seeley, the same question. Yeah, I would echo what um, Dr. Barberts has said as far as, you know, a lot of universities are, you know, not as fortunate as us to have an actual CT scanner on site. I mean, you know, I've, I've often said when I'm giving tours that, you know, working in the, the Sierra Alice and Steffi Center, you know, feels more like being in a university setting. We have so many, you know, tools at our disposal, whether it's, you know, from a diagnostic standpoint with the CT, um, you know, we've got brand new radiology equipment, new ultrasounds, we've got endoscopy. Um, so it's, you know, we've got a lot of tools at our disposal. Um, additionally, you know, from a monitoring standpoint, you know, We've come a long way from just, you know, checking the pulse and making sure they're breathing. You know, right now, <laughs> there's oftentimes, you know, five different monitors checking different parameters on an animal so that we can better manage a, a patient under anesthesia. Um, I really feel like the direction of Cleveland Metro Parks is only going to continue to, you know, progress in that direction where we're, you know, trying to push the envelope with how we can provide the, you know, the best care. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do is provide the best care. You know, she's kind of... Um, talk some about industry standards. I think that's you know a goal of ours. We want to be you know one of those zoos that you know when another institution is thinking about what is the standard, they're, they're they're thinking about Cleveland as one of those institutions that you know is setting the gold standard for for you know general healthcare of animals. I don't know how you guys handle all that technology because whenever I'm in the treatment room, there's always something beeping and going <laughs> off, and I feel like there's that I should be panicking. It's the tech. You guys, it is the you guys are, yeah, you guys are always under control. So, um, Doc, same question for you. I think, it's, I think it's a combination of the technology, blending the technology with the, uh, with the training. Um, I think we've made more strides in the past three to four years in uh, being able to monitor animals without having to do anesthesia on them. Uh, we're capable of drawing blood from uh, lions and tigers and, and leopards and bears and giraffe and elephants. And, uh, and gorillas. Um, the sad thing about it is I've never seen any of this <laughs> because I have such a history with these animals that if I show up, um, they charge the bars and then they run and hide underneath the bench at the back of the exhibit. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, we've, we've, we just picked up a uh, cardiac ultrasound unit. And this is a really sophisticated piece of equipment and I have no idea how to even turn the machine on, but <laughs> thanks to Joni, um, she can go down and get you know, really good uh, uh, pictures of these things, ultrasounds of these things. I have to watch it 
on the screen at the hospital because if I go down there, all hell breaks loose. Um, but I, th I think a, a, a really important thing um, is, is the confidence that the uh, people that we work with, the curators, the keepers, the director, uh, have in the veterinary department in knowing that um, we are going to do our absolute best when it comes to these animals to do the diagnostics. And if we need to do an anesthesia, they're not standing in our way saying, no, you can't do this. They're open to the science and the technology that we need to, to progress forward. And I think that's the thing that I'm most grateful for. And before you guys think that Doc's exaggerating about how animals respond, I'll just say, Dr. Seelig, you, you participate in the cardiac ultrasound process, right? You're there, you're, yes. you're able to, to work with the, with, with the gorillas. When, before we got to this point and we were training heart rate monitoring, just you being in the general vicinity of the heart rate monitoring, the gorilla's heart rate went yeah, through it, the roof. It, it took a long time to get them accustomed to me, you know, even being there. Um, it, it's, you know, just like with anything, it just takes time. And, and that's a credit to all of you for investing that time, because that's time that you're not doing paperwork and doing the <laughs> records and all that other stuff. So, and that, that, that's a commitment, so I, I appreciate that, so. That'll be my excuse. <laughs> so um, I, I want to sort of open it up for questions from the audience. I think we might be having some, some questions come in uh, via Twitter, but I, I did want to, you mentioned the vet tech. So where, where are our vet techs? Can our vet techs stand up? You could argue that they do all the hard work. But um, they, they do a tremendous amount of work for us. So I want to say thank you. And because they're, they're part of those, those, those veterinary procedures. So um, I will open it up to the audience. Anyone have any questions for this panel? Right. There we go. I knew we'd have one. Yes, sir. Microphone coming to you. I I made it. As this uh, population of animals in zoos all over the world age, I guess the new philosophy is you don't want to try to bring them in from the outside. Um, what's going to happen to the science? We're already seeing changes in the populations. Um, we have to work very hard at trying to maintain the genetics and maintain the, the, the breeding on these animals. It's, it's become more and more difficult to bring them in from the wild. Uh, we are seeing a, a longer lifespan in many of these animals. And uh, not too long ago, we had a tufted deer who was 10 years old who uh, uh, conceived and, and had, a, had a, an offspring uh, at 10 years of age, which is probably equivalent to a person being you know, 60 years old. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, as, as we improve on things like nutrition and husbandry and management and things like that, and, and being able to maintain um, better preventive medicine so they're not succumbing to other problems, we can keep them alive longer. Uh, the problem is then deciding at what point uh, do we have to move on from this and, uh, you know, how, how long do we maintain them? It's a difficult question, but it's one that fortunately I'm not going to be around to have to answer. So. <laughs> Another question in the back over here? Uh, uh, two questions, and you could answer them at the same time. First of all, do you call each other doctor? Because that seems to be happening right now. But secondly, you have so many exciting things happening. How do you kind of? Break, you know, decide who does what. I mean, is there a pecking order, or is it? How's it? How's uh, of, of course, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I think we we all have a very strong interests. Dr. Seelig is interested very much in surgery. Uh, I'm kind of a meatball surgeon. I can get it done if I need to, but if there's a, a fancy surgery to do. I'll let him do it, and I'll just stand there and be a you know a living retractor. Uh, I'm okay with that. Um, 
And as, uh, as we bring Dr. Barberitz on board, um, it's more important for her to do things. And I can tell you from personal experience, the hardest thing to do is to stand around with your hands in your pockets watching somebody else work. <laughs> And somebody else is finding I'm that, learning that right very now. hard. <laughs> I guess to answer that other part of that question, we do not call each other doctor. Except Doc. He just Doc, died. we call Doc Doc. Another one over there? Dr. Barberts, talk about your Wolf's Women surgery. Oh, come uh, here. Uh, this is actually an episode after this was done that I said we have to have her. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you. Um, so this is, uh, so Pierre is a Wolf's Gwenin who, um, I think Doc and I were on, or oh, see, like must have been somewhere else, um, got called for um, an emergency that said, you know, this animal's arm is bleeding, we think he's been bitten. So Doc and I go up, and I was an intern here, um, and I look in the cage after them trying to bring him in, and you know, half of this animal's forearm was basically missing. I mean, the bones were still attached, but um, the muscle was all gone. Um, and I looked at it, and I said, I don't think I can fix that, <laughs> um, but I'll try. So um, we anesthetized it, and this, I think, was on a, like a Friday afternoon or Friday night. Um, so after a couple hours surgery of cleaning and basically stitching together what looked like it might belong in the right area. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we recovered him and you know, kept him in the hospital for, gosh, probably two or three months. At least. Yeah. Um, doing regular um, anesthesias to clean the wound and change his bandages. Um, and after maybe two months, we started notice, noticing he was using his hand. And shortly after that, he was using his arm. And now I think he's at Audubon, is that correct? So he is off um, away from his aggressor, but um, with um, full use of his arm. And they, I mean, other than the scar, they said that there's, there's absolutely no way that you could have told, could tell that that even happened to him. So it was one of my very proud cases. <laughs> Thank you. When you're the spouse of a zoo veterinarian, you know all dinner plans are conditional, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do we have another one out there? So, so while, while Rachel's coming around, I, I want to ask, we haven't talked about nutrition at all and how nutrition fits into the picture of veterinary medicine. Can, can one of you gonna kind of lead in on that? I guess I, I, guess I need to. Uh, <laughs> the, the nutrition in, in, uh, in zoos is, is fairly complicated. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the most difficult things that we have to do is, is uh, getting, getting the keepers and the curators to stick to a diet. It's probably the most difficult thing there is to do. Uh, everybody, everybody likes feeding, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, it's only a little bit. And uh, probably the, the, the best example of this was uh, uh, the orangutans. Uh, the orangs were, were, they had a little bit more weight than they needed to. And uh, I approached the keeper about, you know, I've, I've got this diet listed out, and I've got the kilocalories figured out, and how much this animal should be eating, and, and it looks like, you know, we, we just can't get this thing to lose any weight. I said, are you sticking to the diet? Is, is this the only stuff that you're feeding to this animal? On a stack of Bibles, you know, he's swearing that this is all he feeds. And then he walks over to the, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, refrigerator, pops the freezer open, and pulls out a popsicle, and he's he's moving her from from uh, from from uh, uh, enclosure to enclosure with the popsicle. Okay, that that was his training treat. So yes, he's sticking very strictly to the diet. He's not changing it at all, but it was all the other little things in between. And uh, so we've we've gotten the cooperation of most of the keeper staff at this point, where they they take the the part of the diet. Okay, like the fruits and and vegetables and nuts and things that the animals really like, and they use those for a lot of the training treats. And so, uh, keeping the keeping the animals' weight at a at a nice even level is probably one of the hardest things we have to do uh, with nutrition in this zoo. Food is love. I, I will comment on that as well. Um, 
So I think, you know, in this day and age, most people know that your health is, is very much related to your nutrition. Um, and there was just not a lot of information about, you know, what these animals should be eating. A lot of primates were being fed the same thing. Um, and that's where, you know, we rely a lot on you know, conservationists and scientists out there in the field um, to let us know really what these animals are supposed to be eating. And so I would say probably in the last 10 years um, of zoo medicine, there's been a huge shift on what we're feeding animals. So things are, are much more formulated to what they should be, should be eating. Um, you know, our conservation and science department studied um, studies our, our great apes and they have switched all of our um, gorillas from a, to a primate free a primate biscuit free diet so much more of what they would be normally receiving in the wild and we've seen huge um, you know trends in their health to where they're you know just much more active and um, we're better able to manage them if we feed them correctly right. huge change mm -hmm. Rachel in the uh, discussion of the uh, egg bound ostrich uh, there was a mention of uh, well we're going to write this up Seems like uh, peer-reviewed journals and articles uh, would be an important product of zoo medicine and the other sciences. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you say a few words about, about that? Sure, um, we do. Um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, you know, it, um, at this point, it's kind of balancing the, um, you know, trying to find the time to, to do that. Um, you know, just the, um, Last year, we were able to, to get two um, articles published. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but several years ago, we had a, a giraffe that was born with a hernia. And um, it was um, the first hernia that had been noted in a, a giraffe. There had been other cases of you know, similar problems in the umbilical area um, at other institutions, but this was the first true hernia. Um, so we um, coupled um, our case report with the case reports from that other institution. We were able to get a really good article out, and now that's you know, out there in, in the uh, you know for everyone to be able to, to learn from in the event that you know they were able to see. Um, and hopefully now that you know Dr. Barwitz is here, we'll have a little bit more time to you know write up some of that stuff and, and continue to do that. Uh, but that's definitely the direction that we we want our our um, you know veterinary practice to, to go in is to, to do more in the way of you know articles and, and even original research at some point. It's it's. Uh, not that we have a lack of cases to write up. It's, it's the idea that you need several hours of uninterrupted time to get it done. And uh, you do revision after re revision after revision in order to, in order to get these accepted. And uh, when you're busy running around putting out fires all the time, it's hard to do that. So it's nice to have a full staff at this point. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to spend a little more time uh, devoting uh, to to writing. Another one back there. You're talking about uh, mammals, the warm-blooded ones. I'm concerned also about the cold ones, the snakes, <laughs> lizards, turtles. Do you have specialties of that? Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have Dr. Yeah. Felix. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, it, it's, it's no secret that turtles are definitely my favorite animals to to work on. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the, the cold-blooded um, animals, we definitely try and give them the same level of care that we do any of the other, you know, kind of more, you know, characteristic animals that we think of when we go to a zoo. Um, it, it, you know, it can be a little bit more challenging sometimes depending on the species. Um, for example, um, Dr. Barberts just last week um, did an exploratory surgery on a frog to uh, try and, you know, remedy a situation. Uh, it was a, an obstruction. Um, so, so yeah, we, we definitely try. Um, it just logistically, logistically can be a little bit more challenging just due to the patient size. What type of frog was that? Was it small or large? It was a 56 gram Amazon milky tree frog. Oh. <laughs> it's doing really well. <laughs> There's a question up here. You say nutrition and medic. What it, when an animal needs medication, are your um, uh, roles for improving animal health? Where's exercise with these animals that are in confined areas? 
Um, that's a great point because you're right. You know, no matter how large some of our enclosures are, you know, we're not going to be able to replicate you know what they would be doing in the wild. Um, so we try and you know do the best that we can. So you know we take their diet and we, and we try and offer it in certain ways such that it encourages them to move you know around their enclosure and move in natural ways. Um, you know not only just you know, moving in different areas of the enclosure, but also putting it at different times. So, you know, they're not exactly sure when they're going to get fed. So it, it kind of, you know, replicates that natural foraging behavior that they'd be doing in the wild to try and, you know, encourage that sort of exercise, which, you know, I agree is, is definitely important for their overall health. We have two really good examples right now. Uh, one is the African elephant crossing, where the elephants have the ability to uh, use two different spaces and uh, so that's that by by moving animals around in that exhibit, it really forces them to, to do a lot more walking. Um, the other uh, good example of that is the is the new tiger exhibit. Uh, by moving those animals from enclosure to enclosure, uh, it gives them an opportunity to explore new things. Um, you put food in different places and areas at different times, as he mentioned. Uh, so we're we're working on improving the habitats for these animals uh, and trying to get out there and, and force them to do jumping jacks. We're not going to be able to do that, but you know, there are other ways that we can address some of these problems. Got a question back there? I wonder if you could comment on the role of zoos in the uh, issue of climate change. It certainly plays a role in public education, but I wonder if there's a role for zoos in some sense of helping the, probably the anticipated change in uh, uh, species distributions and with the climate change that we're all seeing. Maybe I should answer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that there's, there, there's a unique role that zoos can fill in all levels of environmental education, environmental impact, behavior change. And we're very early in the stages of really revamping our conservation program, uh, Future for Wildlife, that focuses on the species impacts on all these environmental issues, but it gives us a platform to talk about climate change, water quality, you know, all of these things that um, are directly a result of human behavior. You know, I, I, I say all the time, zoos and aquariums are the only conservation organizations in the world that have an audience. You know, that we, we have an audience of people who come through our doors who may not care about climate change necessarily. They came to see the lion, right? So um, it's a really great opportunity for us. It's a really unique opportunity for us. Um, the easy answer is that we slap up a bunch of signs that talk about climate change and what you can do. We know that that doesn't have the impact that we would hope it does, right? So it's, it's more complicated than that. And you know, the mission statement of the zoo is to create compelling experiences that connect people with wildlife and inspire personal responsibility to take conservation action. We want people to come here and change their behavior as a result. So that happens at a number of different levels and we work through it in, in a number of different ways. We're probably not as successful as we want to be yet, but it's certainly uh, um, a, a goal that this team doesn't shy away from. We're, 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 sort of, we're certainly taking the lead on it and we're gonna address it and find a way to do it because that's really what we exist for. So I don't know if you guys wanna to add to that, but so with that, I got one more question. We got opportunity for one more question here. You already had one. <laughs> Since you obviously enjoy working on a diverse population here, are there any plans that you would like to add to the collection of the zoo? Is it possible or to provide mates for animals? Do they breed through artificial means these days, or just is, will the collection expand at all? Actually, we're looking at the composition of the collection that we have right now, uh, trying to determine for the next 20, 30 years uh, what we're going to specialize in, what animals we're going to leave in the collection, which ones we're going to move out. Um, the discussion today was, uh, you know, renovating uh, the northern uh, trek area where the bears and, and uh, uh, tigers are at. We, we renovated that tiger area and now we're looking at maybe adding uh, the other carnivores in there, the snow leopards, the leopards, 
uh, things like that. Uh, what do we do with the bears? Do we keep all the different bear species? Do we concentrate on two, uh, two or three bear species? Um, looking at hoofstock, okay? Uh, we, we've talked about uh, bringing Takin into the collection and what that's gonna take. Um, and the uh, ever-growing restrictions on uh, moving, uh, moving these animals into and out of the United States and into the state of Ohio. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a, an ongoing discussion, um, and it's, it's uh, driven by economics, it's driven by um, our capabilities, it's driven by the needs of the animals. Um, there are a lot of things that go into that. Uh, and it's not, it's not a simple question. Um, so I'll take that, as Doc put it very professionally, to put my kitchen that I'd love a hippo, so. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> So I want to thank our fabulous veterinary team for a great evening. I want to thank you all for everything you do for us. It's fantastic. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure the animals do, although they're not going to write you any thank you cards. Um, really appreciate it. So one more time for our veterinary staff. I'll look at the camera and thank Billy Steffi. Uh, for her support of the Sarah Allison Steffi Center for Zoological Medicine, the David Steffi Chair, and this lecture for the past 12 years. Uh, that ongoing support has been tremendous for us as an organization that's allowed us to do a lot of the stuff that you've heard about today. So thanks to Sarah and her family for all of that support. So a round of applause for <laughs> And, and the last thing I want to do is uh, thank Jim Francis, Liz Fowler, the staff at the Cleveland Zoological Society, and all of you. Uh, quite honestly, the support that you all give Cleveland Zoological Society and Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is tremendous. We couldn't do what we do without your support. We really appreciate it. We hope you'll be there in the future because we've got really, really big plans. So thank you again for coming out tonight. And we'll see you next year, if not sooner.